Welcome everybody, it's great to be here and um, yes, my name's Kirsty Bashforth and we've got an hour together and in that hour I want to explore what it takes to go from being somebody in a team who's doing to somebody who's leading a team and that could be at any stage of your career and at any background or context. So for any of you in the room, whether you are stepping up into a leadership role whether you are already in a leadership role but trying things out, or whether you are an experienced leader and looking for some coaching tips, I hope I'm able to give you just a few thoughts, whether that's an aha moment or some sort of validation that what you're doing is the right thing, or whether it's just some empathy that when you step up, yes, it can be hard, that's okay, you're not alone. I hope there's something you can take away from this session. And what we'll do is I'll put some input into the room and then we will have a little bit of a discussion back so that it's interactive because I do want to understand your wisdom and your ideas in the room uh, because every day I am learning all the time. I have been in business for 33 years. I started out of university as an economics graduate in 1991, which sounds probably like ancient history to many of you. Doesn't seem so long ago. Uh, for me and yes I've been in the corporate world in various uh, guises uh, since then. My journey to and through leadership has been up and down. I have had good moments, terrible moments and I found I've learnt most from the terrible moments. More about what not to do or observing leaders who I think I really never want to end up as a leader like that. So that's how I've learnt a lot and I, and I keep learning. I have lived in and worked in the US twice, in Denmark, in Belgium and the UK. I've also worked in private equity companies, publicly listed companies, family founder owner companies. I've worked for myself and in anything from 80,000 people to a single company. And I've worked in energy, health, education, construction, outsourcing and now information services. And these lessons I've learnt along the way, the input I'm going to give you, is in my mind generic to any of those contexts. I think this is about human behaviour and how we adjust to being more senior or having more impact. So um, I hope many of you will be in different industries or different roles or different functional skill sets, but I hope there's something here to take away for each of you. If you want to stop me at any time, please do. Please do. Okay, what I'm going to cover is the first thing is around your identity has changed when you are um, stepping up into a leader. There's a lot of things that change. The second thing I'm going to cover is how to be an effective leader. And the third thing I'm going to cover is how, what about me? Me as a leader, what does it feel like and how do I keep my performance up? in a leadership role because if many of you in the room are stepping up I can imagine some of the things I'm going to say may feel very exposing or a bit oh my goodness why would I want to be a leader from my personal experience I've loved it there have been stressful moments but I love the impact that you can have and the amount that you can learn but there are those things that you need to take into account what's changed how to be effective and how to look after yourself so the first one about your role, your identity has changed, your role has changed. In my view, you are now an air traffic controller, no longer the pilot of the plane. You are not just a more senior pilot when you are leading teams. You are an air traffic controller. You are setting the environment. You are controlling the airspace, not just flying the plane. And that is a very different role and I would encourage you all to think about that role very consciously in three ways. The first is your mindset. You are now in service to others who you are leading. You are not just delivering what you're delivering, but you are in service to others. You have a responsibility. You now have a duty of care at work in how people are able to perform their work, whereas previously you were doing your tasks, delivering what you were asked. And you are creating an environment. So you have a responsibility to create an environment 
which enables people to thrive. Your activities are different as well. You have tasks, absolutely, but they are different tasks. You are setting direction. You are discussing strategy. You are making decisions that impact others and that are instructing others to do things. So your mindset needs to be different. You have a different level of responsibility and you have different activities. And the percentage of your time on what you're doing and spending with people will be very different. There is also a different definition of success. No longer is your success simply what you've done and how well you've delivered it and possibly whether you're a good team member. Now the definition of success is beyond you. Is your team performing well? Because it is a reflection on you because you choose your team and you have a choice on who's on your team. So it is the reputation of your team, whether people are excited about the talent that you are leading, that is one of the definitions of your success. And that's quite a mind shift. It's not just, I'm great, my team's rubbish. That doesn't cut it. If you're great and your team's rubbish, maybe you're not so great because you're leading that team. So it's beyond you is the definition of success. And it can be a hard shift to make. It, it's OK if it feels hard. It felt very hard for me a number of times. And the, the hardest time was my first time I became a leader. I had never managed a team. I had never managed another human being. And BP in 2004, yes, I'd managed 13 years of a corporate career and never managed anybody. And BP suddenly propelled me to lead a team of 200 in 17 countries. I was four months pregnant with my second child and I was made into a role called a group leader, which was the top 500 in BP's 80,000. Quite scary, quite exposing. And eight weeks into the job, the leader of BP Chemicals at that time decided, well, not decided, announced that they were splitting the company in half. And so my task for the next few months, because I had a, a sort of a service center, was to go down a list and work out who stayed and who went very, very stressful step up into leadership. I would hope for many of you it's not as extreme as that, but I learnt a lot. Um, I did like the time I, I uh, spent there, but it was very stressful. And more about that in a minute. So the other thing that's changed other than your role is now you have a new identity. You have a new identity in the eyes of others. You are looked at more. Other people are looking to you. They are looking to you to set the pace, to set direction. You may or may not realise it, but you set the tone. You are the boss. So people will defer to you for decisions. They will look to you to sort out disputes. You are telling them whether they are doing well or not, and you are giving them feedback. So in other people's eyes, you have changed quite a lot. You are performing a different role. Now, for those people who did not know you before, that may not be odd for them, and it may not be odd for you. But if you have stepped up from a peer role to a role working with the same people, that's quite, that's quite different. So it takes some getting used to. And one of the things that I personally found quite tough to get used to was you will not be liked all of the time. It is really important you are respected and people are okay working with you and I would hope feel like they are thriving working with you. And it is not the case that you will not be liked but you have to find a way to get used to the fact that not everybody will like your decisions, not everybody. It's not about being the most popular person in the team. You almost need to remain now a little distant from the team being too friendly and just one of the girls, one of the guys in the team, that's not really what leadership is about. You do want to engage. You do want to spend time with them. You do need to understand them. And it would be great if they like you and you like them. But that is not the be all and end all or a definition of a good leader. I found a great quote here about leadership. And it said, being a leader is disappointing your people at a rate they can absorb. Now that sounds very negative, but when you are in a leadership position, you will never keep everybody happy. You cannot, you have to take some decisions, but I love that quote. And you may, in your new identity,
feel a bit of an imposter at some times. That's okay. I had a huge imposter syndrome. I'm not worthy. I can't do this. Everybody thinks I'm an idiot. Everything I do, they're looking at me. And then eventually you get used to it and realize that most people have a little bit of an imposter syndrome. They may talk a good game, they may show up really confident, but they also don't fully know what they're doing. Or they may have a little bit of a, a confidence crisis. So, and this, this change in your identity can happen at any time in your career. So I have also, I, I'm currently a board director of a couple of listed companies in the FTSE in the UK. And I was al I'd already been a leader for a number of years, but in 2014, I joined the board of a listed company. And that was a real step up into a different form of leadership, whereas suddenly I was not making the operational decisions, setting the operational direction. I was standing between the management and the shareholders. And so uh, it was a new form of leadership. And it took me, honestly, at the age of 44, it took me three years in my head to earn my seat. And that was all about up here. Am I asking the right questions? Do people think I should be around the board? So you never stop learning. And it's OK to not always feel confident when you step into a new leadership role. So it took me three years. It, my, my second listed board role took me about a year. And then my third listed board role, I decided it was fine after a week. I was here. I had been recruited. Get over yourself, Kirsty. So next one. Another thing that has changed is the impact you are having. And there are two really important points here. One is mirrors and one is shadows. If you are to be an effective leader and move from doer to leader, you really need to be able to look in the mirror and be honest with what you see. That does not mean you are the worst evil bad leader on the planet. It also does not mean you are perfection from day one. You are somewhere in the middle, but be honest with yourself about what you see and go ask others what they see of you. What is your reputation? I remember in BP asking somebody, um, when, you, when you think of me and doing my job, what, what do you think of? And some of the answers come back are quite surprising. But understand them because the leader you are is what is in the perception of others, not just the definition of what you think you're doing. It's are people choosing to follow you and are you leading them so that they can thrive? So be prepared to look in the mirror and be honest with yourself. Be really honest. And it's fine to be you. Be authentic, but be honest. The, uh, uh, again, in this BP Chemicals role, we had something called reverse mentoring. And I was set with a Belgian uh, engineer called Luke Haustemans. And he was pretty junior in the organisation. He was Belgian. He was working offshore in Azerbaijan. And... He was an engineer. He was about as far away from what I did in BP. We were very far away from each other. Level, skill set, nationality, location. But every two months, we would have a meeting and he would tell me what he was hearing about me. Uncomfortable as it was, it was really useful because when you're a leader, your impact is not just your team, it is further out and people have myths and perceptions and hearsay and chat in the corridor. That's not to say you can shut it down. You just probably need to know it and maybe you need to adjust some things and ensure you communicate really well. Another thing just around, uh, around what's changed is shadows. When you are stepping up to leadership, the impact you have is much bigger because people are looking to you and therefore if you come in the office with a really bad mood that day. People won't just see a bad mood, they may see something's really wrong in the business because that person's in a bad mood, so what's really happening? Or they may see that it's okay just for everybody to be in a really bad mood, or it may demotivate people, but it's more than just you. You are setting a shadow, positive or negative, your shadow is much longer than it was. I remember one of my bosses, a guy called JB Renard from um, Paris, he said to me, Kirsty, why does everybody suddenly, why is everybody an Arsenal football fan in this office? I said, well, which team do you support, JB? And he went, Arsenal. I said, well, that's because everybody finds fascinating what the boss is mildly interested in. Because the boss is the boss. And people like to keep in with the boss. 
So suddenly everybody was talking about football. I'm not sure they were all football fans, but that was a way they could connect with JB, who was the boss. So what you find mildly interesting suddenly becomes pretty important chat around the team. So bear that in mind. You create a much bigger shadow when you are a leader. That's nothing to be scared about. It's just to be more mindful about how you behave and how you act, because it's more in the spotlight than when you were not leading. Also, when I was leading the culture shift at um, BP, I went up to Aberdeen to our uh, upstream European offices. And I went to do some focus groups and I met a guy called Cliff. We had a meeting and there were some offshore platforms on the screens and then I sat next to Cliff. And Cliff said to me, here comes another suit from head office. I won't hear you again. And I thought, wow. So that's what he thinks of all people in head office. So when I say that, and Cliff and I are now great friends, actually, he came to my book launch, we stay in touch, we know each other's families, because I did go back and I didn't wear a suit the next time, and he was nicer, and we worked together very, very much, and he's featured in my book, actually. But the point of the story there is, again, your shadow is long and people can blow things out of proportion and then label you. Just bear in mind, we all do it ourselves. We know we all do it about other leaders. We label them. So just be mindful about that. So that's some things about what changed in your world when you are a leader. What about how to be a leader? How, what are the effective things in the way to work? The first thing I would say is it is a balancing act. You are never in a state of perfection and total nothing's changing, I've got this sorted, I'm in a zen state of leadership. You, you, you should be, never, and if you think you are, you have stopped learning. And you have misunderstood the balancing act that I think leadership is. An old boss of mine, again at BP, a guy called Helmut Schuster, he said there were four things that he observed in leadership that people needed to hold in balance, and I have never heard a simpler or better model. He said, the first thing a leader has to do is set direction. The second thing is a leader has to create boundaries. The third thing is that leader has to enable space for people to deliver. And the fourth thing is that they have to provide support. And trying to keep those in balance at all times is really important. It's no good just to set a whole load of direction and run off. It's no good just to be telling people no, no, no without direction. It's no good just to be very supportive, but with no boundaries. It's the, it's the balance that you have to try and create. And I've put the, that, that, that um, balance board on the, because you're never quite getting the balance right. There will be days, there could be months, when all you seem to be doing is, is creating boundaries. And you just have to be mindful of, gosh, when did I last actually provide somebody some space to deliver? Or am I just in their face all the time? So just bear that in mind, four things, direction, boundaries, space, support. You're also setting an environment and there's a balance there. Where am I creating a, an environment that is psychologically safe for people to speak up, hear feedback, raise their hand when they've made a mistake, but at the same time have enough motivation and accountability? How do I do that so that people really thrive they know they're going to get feedback, they feel they belong, they are pushed towards objectives, and if they don't deliver those objectives, they won't get a great performance rating and won't move on. But how is that an environment where people can still feel it's okay to speak? So it's quite a balance, that environment setting as well. It's one thing in the job I'm doing today at Delinean, which is the parent company of Inviso, is one thing I'm constantly doing, trying to constantly think, Am I diving in too much? Am I, because I'm, I'm Chief People and Culture Officer which over, in a company that oversees and owns 16 different companies. So that balancing act of where to spend my time, but more to the point, what is my role? Where am I pushing? Where am I helping? Where am I leaving them alone? Where am I setting boundaries? It's quite, quite a challenge. A, a thrill, but quite a challenge. Another thing to be effective as a leader is to tune in. And what I mean by that is build your EQ muscle. And if you haven't got any EQ, go buy some, go find some, 
go get help to get some EQ. When you lead a team, you have to understand what's going on. And you won't do that just by a scorecard. And you won't do that by just going up to people saying, how is everything going? Is it fine? Because people won't necessarily react the way you want. They won't necessarily feel OK to speak, no matter how you set the climate. So you have to go do your research and find out from other sources, informal sources, other people. Listen, listen on the corridors, just chat, even just understand people's moods and you will be able to pick up what the climate is you're setting. As a, a board director, we tend to go on operational visits. That's fine, but they're very much formal set piece events where everybody is sort of on best behavior because the board is in town. I find it much better and more effective to understand what's going on by if they're hosting a webinar on a topic, I can pick up what is the mood in the organization by just how they're asking questions, how many people have turned up, are they interacting? You can get a lot more data about the climate that is being set by the informal sort of coming at it round the back and not asking direct questions. So tune in and find your own ways to tune in. As I say, if you don't feel that you have any EQ, go find some. It's a really important muscle to build. Um, my, one of my favourite bosses, a guy called Ross Polari, when I was um, his chief of staff in ahead of BP America, he said, I work, used to work in a, in a terminal, an oil terminal in Ohio when I started. And he said, I worked with the, um, the, the terminal sort of operations manager was a lady called Iris. And Iris worked her entire career in that one terminal. And he said, no matter how I moved on my career, every six months, Iris would send me an email telling me what was going on in the organization. He said it was some of the most valuable feedback I ever had because she just remembered me as Ross and she never thought of me as a boss because she'd never worked with me since and she just kept giving me the feedback. Most importantly though, he recognized back to her that he'd heard the messages. So tune in and, and help people understand that you're tuning in. Another one in being effective is to filter the noise. And what do I mean by that? The higher up you go, the more sets of inputs, the more people who want a bit of you, the more people who will give you opinions, some of them you don't want, um, but listen to them. And then, but you have to filter out the more actions you will have. Often leadership to me is it's more decisions, but sometimes it's just more zeros on the end of those decisions. The higher up you go, they're still decisions. But you have to prioritize your time. You have to prioritize your focus and you have to let some things go. And how you find your way to get organized and to be comfortable with letting some things go is a real muscle to build. One of the things that I think about is what are the two or three or four things that if I don't do those and focus on those as the first things or the most important things, what's going to go wrong? Because so often, I don't know about you, I make lists and I deal with the easy stuff first. Tick, 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 all done. And the big stuff is still sitting there. Really focus on the big stuff. Really focus on the big stuff because it's what's going to add the value. It's what's going to get in the way if you don't deal with it. Don't live in denial about priorities when you are a leader. And sometimes that can get too much and you just have to filter out all noise. And again, Ross said to me, he was my last boss before I suddenly went into this group leadership role. I think it was him who propelled me into it. I got him to blame for it. Um, he said, if it all gets too much and you think you've got way too many things to do sometimes, he said, I just go play golf. I come back and I find really I've only got two big priorities, but I got everything into my head that there was too much to go on. For me, I'll watch Netflix or go shopping, whatever it is, um, probably both, uh, but find some sort of release for you to, when the noise just gets too much, filter out, come back, and you will realize there are only two or three massive things you have to do. Again, that feels a bit scary, but you need to do it. How else to be effective? Spot the difference. We all like to work with people that we like. We all like to hire people who are just like me. Wouldn't that be a lovely way to have a team, to run a team? But just like me, 
ended up with a global financial crisis because, as we know, most of the world's leaders were, and the economics and the central bankers were from about five schools. So we did not have diversity of thought and diversity of background. Hire people who are different from you. Hire people who have better skills in particular areas than you. Your role, remember, is air traffic control, not to be the best at everything. You cannot be the best at everything. Your role is to serve the team, to set direction, remember, direction, boundary, space, support, and ensure they are successful because the whole team needs to be successful, and that is your success. Hire different from you, hire better than you, get over your own ego about that. You are not supposed to be the best person in your team. You are leading the team. And I cannot emphasize that enough. It can be exhausting when you have a whole team of people who are very different from you, who want a different way of interacting. And you may have a meeting with each of them each week for half an hour. One of them may come in with a list of five things and take five minutes. Another person may want to talk about their dog for 28 minutes and the last two minutes they get to the point. You have to meet them where they are to in and understand their differences to get the best out of them. It is worth the effort. And if you don't put the effort in, you will end up just with a bunch of mini-me's and something will go wrong or you will not be performing well enough. It is hard yards, but definitely do it. Um, my last team that I ran at BP was probably the most exhausting one I led. And many, many people kept saying to me, how does your team get through so much? They're all so full of energy and they all just deliver so much. I was exhausted, but they were thriving. That was more important. I had a great time doing it, but um, it can be exhausting. But definitely look for difference, hire better than you. To be effective, you do have to do carrot and stick. Again, back to this point about being a leader is not about, the definition of success of a leader is not about being liked. You can be liked, that's great, but it is about being respected, being trusted, being somebody that people will choose to follow. You are not just somebody people choose to follow just because you are in a position of authority. So yes, you have to do the performance management. You have to do the objectives, set the roles, set the targets, and give people senses of where they are. One mantra I find to live by is, nobody in your team should be surprised by their performance management rating at the end of the year. If they are surprised, you have not done your job of giving them feedback through the year because you should be having conversations through the year and they should know what's coming, whether it's brilliant, whether it's mediocre, or if it's terrible, perhaps they might not be there. But, or they might be on the last chance or on some performance improvement plan. It is tough, you have to do it, but nobody in your team should be surprised at the end of the year about their performance rating. On the flip side, people do need recognition and people need it in different ways. Some people just want to thank you. Some people want to be taken out to the pub. Some people don't need anything, but you should thank them anyway. And people need different things, so be bespoke in understand what makes that person really tick, because it can be a little <laughs> tiny thing that makes them feel great. So for example, I was uh, running a programme on Tuesday with one of our other businesses, and I had spoken to this man a while back and asked him what is, what is things in life he can't do without. And I knew he was having a bad day and I knew it was going to be some difficult discussions. So I spoke to the business leader and said, just get Mike some tropical juice at the start of the morning. She said, why? I said, well, he's told me he cannot live without tropical juice. And we know he's going to have a difficult day. So why don't we actually, instead of thanking him, set him up for success. Oh my goodness, it made so much difference. Mike came in and said, oh, tropical juice, I'm happy now. He was absolutely thrilled. So it, it doesn't have to be a big thing, but understand what makes people tick and recognize them through those measures, not just what you think is your sense of recognition. And people do need a North Star, identity, belonging, where are we heading, why are we heading? That helps with the carrot and stick because then people really know what is good, what is bad, what do I need to be motivated about? But carrot and stick to be an effective leader is really important. So that's what's changed as a leader. That's also what to do to be effective as a leader. The third thing is really remember yourself because 
it's really important. I said look in the mirror, but over time, the longer you are a leader, the more you will get to know yourself and the more you really should get to know yourself and work out what keeps you performing well and being there for your team such that you're creating the right shadow, an environment where people can thrive. So this is, this is one of my charts. Top left, I am a complete morning person. I'm never better than at five till nine in the morning on a train or a plane. So I know where and when I work best and if I have to do very detailed work, or write a paper, it will be in the morning. If it's this afternoon, right now, I could not write a paper, I could not sit, look at an Excel spreadsheet, I would be a disaster. In fact, this is the right thing I should be doing at this time of day, because putting pen to paper or doing detail work, pff, the afternoon, disaster. If it was five o'clock this morning, I'd be good. Know when you work best. That does not mean you can tell your other bosses, I'm, I'm just not working today because it doesn't feel right. My point being, if you are scheduling work as a leader, because there are times when you need to take yourself off and just schedule work, know when you do that work and what sort of work you do best. Know when it is, because then it will save you a lot of hassle and um, spinning wheels. Remain healthy. And that sounds so trite, doesn't it? But know what you need. I need blueberries. Have to have blueberries. Have half a punnet of blueberries pretty much every day. Haven't had enough blueberries this week feeling it, but probably I'm feeling it up here because blueberries are my thing that I go to. If it's fitness, whatever it is, think about your health. The most effective leaders also, more often than not, are pretty healthy. And that don't mean you have to be a marathon runner, goodness no. I mean, know what you need to keep you healthy, whether it's sleep, whether it's food, whether it's exercise, whether it's all of them, whether it's downtime, know that. The post-its in the middle, know what makes you tick in terms of your own balance. I also work best when I am really, really busy, like this week, maybe a little busy this week, but my balance is being busy. If I'm not busy, I'm out of balance. That doesn't mean that's right for everybody at all, but know how you can find your balance so that you know what your downtime is or how busy you like to be or whether you are a last minute dot com person or whether you're a planner. And then on the right is, uh, we've been doing this with all our um, companies, it's a portfolio, uh, it's a, a present um, personality profiling tool. And it's really to help people understand how do I react to situations, how do I communicate. It's very important you understand the team members you are leading. Are they detail people? Are they people who feel a lot? Are they people who, who, who are very competitive or not? understand their personality traits because they will react to situations very differently. And the most important thing to start with is you. Do you understand how you react to situations and how you will communicate with others? So this is all about know thyself. The longer you go on being a leader, the more you will learn about yourself, particularly in difficult situations. But it's okay, and I, in fact, I would say it's an important investment to really continue to understand yourself and take some time to do it. We are all work in progress all of the time, but really try hard to understand. The final thing I would say on um, this is it can feel lonely as a leader because suddenly everybody's looking at everybody else, but nobody's looking at you and saying, is that leadership okay? And sometimes we can get into a hero mentality of, well, I'm a leader and they're a leader, so we're all fine because we're leaders. No, we're not, we're humans too with the same stuff going on in our lives as it was before. It's just now we're in service of our team as well. So go, I say, call this one, phone a friend. Go find some friends, whether that is a peer or whether in the business, whether that is somebody outside a business, go find a friend and talk because you may share experiences. You may just want to vent a bit and get somebody to listen to you. Um, you may, you may get yourself a mentor or get yourself a coach. They can be really valuable. If somebody high above you says, you're moving into a leadership role, I think we'll get you a coach. Do not take it as negative feedback. Embrace it because it's extra help. When I went into that first leadership role in BP, the one, the 200 people, four months pregnant, etc. Um, I my boss, very high boss, the one who was splitting up the company above me, gave me a coach 
And I was a bit affronted. I said, I don't need a coach. I'm fine. He said, you need a coach. I don't need a coach. You need a coach, he said, because this is a scary role. And every three weeks for two hours, I went to see Martha in Kensington High Street and sat down with her. And it was just like therapy. She didn't say much, but it was the place where I felt safe to just explore stuff. And we talked about my imposter syndrome, etc. So if you are offered a coach when you're stepping into a new leadership role, take it and invest yourself in it. It is marvellous help. Final word I would say, and then I want to get a little bit of wisdom from you guys. I know we've only got 13 minutes left. I always talk longer than I think I'm going to, is about choice. You may choose that you do not want to lead a team. You may choose that you only want to be a sole contributor and an expert. That in itself is not an awful thing that you're no good. Different people want to do different things, but it is a choice. And if you choose to lead a team, then a couple of things to never do. Never say, I have no choice. It just happened around me. No, you always have a choice. You're in a leadership position. In fact, no matter life, you always have a choice. And if you don't like the choice you've made or the situation you're in, make a choice and do something about it. It may still not be right, but make another choice. Keep making choices until things can get better. The second thing is don't blame others for the decisions you make as a leader. People won't believe you, they won't follow you, you lose integrity, your team loses integrity. If you have made a choice and it doesn't work out and something's gone really wrong, own it. Because if you don't own it, the rest of your team is never going to own up to anything that has not gone right. So you have to set the tone. And people really, I think bottom line, if you think of the best leaders you've worked for, they own their issues, they own their mistakes, they own their decisions. None of us, I think really thrive working for leaders who blame others and say, I couldn't do anything about it. It was just the context. Rubbish. Make a choice. The bottom line, I would say, is a quote from one of my favourite authors, Oscar Wilde, which is, it doesn't matter what choices you make, but be you, because everyone else is taken. Okay? Right. What I would love to do is just get a couple of voices in the audience. Master Shifu on the right, we love Master Shifu. I thought Yoda, but I thought he's a bit 1970s now. We'll go, we'll go with Master Shifu. All of you, as I said at the start, one of the times that I learn the most is when things go wrong. But I also have, as you can hear, a few mantras. So I'd love to hear from you, and there's no right or wrong, but I'm sure you have some better ideas as well in the room. Top three things going wrong when you're learning to be a leader and top three words of wisdom. Just take, oh, some of you are on your own tables. In fact, I'm not going to do sh um, tables. Let's just shout out. Somebody share with me top th a thing that goes wrong or a thing that's a word of wisdom, things that you've learned. And it'll be a very quiet five minutes if nobody says anything. A lesson in everything. There is a lesson in everything. Yeah, keep on learning. Love that. Is that. That's a word of wisdom, not a thing going wrong. Yes? <laughs> Excellent. Great. Love that. There's a lesson in everything. I'm going to write these down because I can add them to my mantras. No team motivation. No team motivation. That's a when things go wrong. Now, and just tell me a little bit more, sir, on is that, you mean when the leadership is bad? The leadership is not doing what it's... Tell me a little bit more about that. So I think it could, uh, Ooh. it's not necessarily to do, but it could be leadership, but it could be to other, other elements as well, like for example, like uh, in a business that you're not being able to achieve the results. Right. So there could be some difficult, challenging moments, but yeah, leadership that is... So I think in terms of leaders, like of the public, you can understand how you're all playing. Yep. Yeah, when things are tough, actually, that's when leadership really needs to come into its own because people will look even more to the leader for help or if they're worried. Good point. Yeah, so watch out for motivation when things are going wrong. Bad leadership. Great. Other things? 
are the words of wisdom that you're aware of. You've seen something going right and think that is such a good leadership trait. Oh, Ooh. microphone. You must all have worked for a leader you admire. You must all have worked for a leader you think was awful. Um, yeah, I've, um, I think you touched on it earlier, Kirsty, but I've seen this done really well is when people bring the same selves to the office every day. So right you up. know you're getting the same boss and you don't have to manage today in a good mood, bad mood, but your team know this is Alex or this is Kirsty or right. whatever it is. That authenticity piece, that and be you, not try, don't try to be somebody else. People always say, ask me, Who's your role model? I don't have a role model, and that's not being complacent. It's just I like what they do, and I like what they do, and I like what they do, and I try bits of things that people do, not to be somebody else. So I think your point is spot on, Alex, thanks. Same self. Imagine the worst boss you've ever worked for. What was, what was going wrong there? Come on. You must have worked for some bad bosses. I don't believe you if you haven't. Lack of transparency, absolutely. Do I know that they're telling me all the right stuff or are they hiding things? And that may not be that they are not saying much. It could also be just how they are showing up and that they seem a bit shifty. So, it, and, and so it's, it, you've really got to invest in communicate, communicate, listen, listen, feedback, feedback, because yeah, it's not just amount of amount of data that you're sharing, it's how you're sharing the data. Really great point. Lack of transparency, okay? Any other goods or bads? Maybe it relates to that. Mm. Lack of empathy. Lack of empathy, yeah. yeah. And leaders worry about their own stuff and they don't take a moment to, to look yeah. around and see that people maybe are getting worried or they're losing sight. Yes. Yeah, it's back to that EQ point, as I said. Go tune in to the environment. And it, it, it's, yes, you need to lead forward and you need to make your choices when, and, and, and change things. But to just ignore how people are feeling is, is difficult. And that's part of the balance because you can't spend all of your time just having a big chat on beanbags saying, how is, ooh, sorry, how is everybody? But at the same time, you do need to empathise with the situation that person is in or the way they feel, and that comes down to understanding them as well. Yeah, empathy is a really, really important point. And if it isn't there, people can feel lost or a bit panicky or could just leave. There's that phrase, isn't there? People join a company and leave their boss. Yeah. I've had three, I remember three really, really, really difficult bosses. That may, maybe they weren't difficult, but me and them couldn't find a way to get on. And it was one of the most stressful, three of the most stressful times that I had. Um, yeah, and I went to get a lot of help from my mentors on them. And then one of them I did actually leave. Okay, any other words of wisdom? Wisdom I've got, um, every day is a lesson. There's a lesson in everything. And I've got bring your same self and your authentic self to work. Ah, back of the room. Yes. Um Words of wisdom would be always ask questions because I think um, it's the only way to learn. Love that. Be curious. Yeah. Want, don't, and don't just fake asking questions because you feel you should. Actually really want to know and inquire from people. Absolutely love that. Always ask questions. And that's, people think sometimes as a leader, I can't, I can't ask a question because I'll look stupid. I'm a leader now, so I must know everything. No. Not at all, because nobody will believe you lower everything. Great, great point. Lessons in everything, same selves, always ask questions. And I've got uh, no motivation, lack of transparency and lack of empathy on the bad side. Any, I've got five minutes left, one, one on either side. One more word of wisdom, one more. Oh, yes, at the front here. <coughs> Lack of courage. Oh, that's a good word as well. I witness, and I think everyone here has witnessed situations where, for example, there is a leader, um, a partner, for example, um, who knows uh, a person isn't really 
adding value to the team or is in yeah. a bad situation, but uh, they prefer like um, put the thing away. Yes, not hide it. Yeah. Pretend it's not happening. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. And yeah. Maybe that like blows up eventually. It does eventually, and then it blows up even worse. Yes, so that courage point to take those tough decisions, and the tough decisions, you sometimes know them in your gut. You know, you feel, you feel them and you're, well, maybe it'll get better, maybe it'll get better, but the leadership role is to take those tough decisions, and that does take courage, yes. And it, me it comes back to you won't be popular then, but you'll be more unpopular later on if you, don't, if you don't do it. Great one. And one more word of wisdom, and then I will finish up with my last slide. One more positive thing. Best leader you've ever worked for. Tell me one thing that they did brilliantly. Alex, again. Um, I felt they had trust in me. Trust in you. Oh, yes. Whether it was true or not. Yeah, whether it was true or not. <laughs> but you felt it. Yeah, so as, as do your team members feel that you trust them and that you have their backs? And yes, we can have, you know, behind the scenes, we can go, oh God, that was dreadful. But, you know, do they, do they have trust in you? Because do they believe you can turn it around? Or do they believe that actually, because you've hired different from you and you've hired better than you, that actually you'll do a better job than they would? Great, love that. So we've got, there's a lesson in everything. Bring your same self, your authentic self to work. Always ask questions and provide trust in your team because you've hired them. On the bad side, watch out for creating this bad set of low motivation. Really understand that. Don't create a sense of lack of transparency and that's not just what you say, it's how you're saying it. Watch out for a lack of empathy because people will lose you or you'll lose them and watch out for a lack of courage. You do have to take those decisions. Great inputs. Thank you, everybody. Right. Shameless plug <laughs> to finish. I wrote a book when we shifted BP's culture after its biggest disaster. And everything I'm talking about here today is just about what makes people tick. It's, you could call it culture. You could call it behavioral economics. But it's really just what makes us tick. And business is done by humans. I mean, it, no matter AI, no matter everything, still, humans are making deals. Humans have relationships. What makes us tick will make us better if we understand it and we tap into everybody else. So um, thank you very much for your time. Thank you for your attention. I can see people listening because they're sort of looking and nodding. Um, so uh, good luck on the leadership journey you are on. Remember, you're there in service of others. You're now an air traffic controller. You're not just a more important pilot, but be you, because everyone else is taken. Thank you.